Thus, that is the prayer of your heart today, that uh, the Lord will create a, a clean heart within you, and that uh, as we worship Him together today, we will indeed see Jesus. We'd like to dismiss the children for Children's Church at this time, and as they are slipping out, I'd like to invite you to take your Bible and turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, I have uh, entitled my message today, Where Are We Going? often uh, ask my wife, where am I? <laughs> where am I? <clears throat> where are we going? I'd like to introduce you to the book of 2 Peter and uh, to our, our study. I want to begin today by making a very uh, important statement. The church in America today is being deceived and led astray from the truth of God's word. Uh, we are living in a day in which what is called progressive Christianity has infiltrated the church, it has infiltrated our Bible colleges, our seminaries, and it is now uh, infiltrating the church. Progressive Christianity. Uh, there is a handout, if you can imagine, on our Spiritual Growth Resource Center that will introduce you to progressive Christianity. Uh, to give you the bottom line, uh, socialism, communism, and Marxism are infiltrating the church. I shared with you in recent weeks a number of statistics that uh, are absolutely shocking. One third of evangelical Christians do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. It just goes from there. And again, uh, if you are interested, there is a handout that provides uh, some of those results, and you can take that and, and study it for yourself. It ought not to surprise us that this is taking place. Uh, the Bible tells us very clearly that in the last days there is going to be great apostasy from the church, and we are witnessing that day by day. The Apostle Paul, uh, as he is at the end of his life, writes a letter to Timothy, and the parallel is very important for us to understand. Second Peter is Peter's last will and testament. He is about to be martyred, and so we see in, in Second Peter, as he is preparing to die, that which is important to him. And as we look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul is about to die, and he is writing to Timothy concerning those things that are important to him. And what we see is that they both agreed. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. At my uh, ordination council, as I was preparing to officially enter the ministry, Dr. Leonard Hillstrom preached on this passage of Scripture, and I'll never forget him pointing his finger at me and saying, Preach the Word. <laughs> that's, a great, uh, <laughs> that's a great memory to hang on to. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Why? For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Let me boil it down to its essence. The time is coming when people will turn away from listening to the truth and they will wander off into myths. That day has come. It is here. As I have shared with you, the church in America is very rapidly moving away from the truths of the Word of God. And so it is for that reason that I believe that we have come today to this study of 2 Peter. I want to point out to you, I don't know if, uh, if you remember this, but uh, some time ago as I introduced you to the book of 1 Peter, I described for you the geographical area that Peter was writing to. 
And that geographical area was the exact same area that we went over to Revelation chapters 2 and 3 and we saw seven letters written to seven churches. It's the same geographical area. And Peter is now writing this second letter and he is warning the churches that he is writing to that false teachers are going to infiltrate the church and they're going to seek to lead you astray. And guess what? In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we see exactly that. As, as church after church, Jesus condemns them for the false teachers and false teachings that they have allowed to come into the church. The question that I want to ask you is, as we go through the book of 2 Peter, are we going to pay attention and listen? And be aware that wolves have come into the church and are wreaking havoc, havoc in these last days. Wolves in sheep's clothing. And so this morning, by way of introduction, we're going to do the impossible. Casey was stunned. <laughs> you went through the entire book of 2 Peter. <laughs> we normally get through a verse or two, right? <laughs> Today, we are going to, by way of introduction, we are going to read through the book of 2 Peter, and I'm going to highlight for you the, the themes, the, uh, the key messages, the lessons that we are going to be learning as we go through this book. And so, uh, fasten your seatbelt or take your seatbelt off, whichever you prefer. We're going to move. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word, it's a privilege to uh, begin this study of 2 Peter. And it's so timely because the very uh, departure of which we are warned is taking place before our eyes. And Lord God, uh, we ourselves are in great danger. If we do not stand firm on the word of God, we too will be swept away by the false teachings that are being propagated. And so Lord, as we open your word, as we read through this book, may your Holy Spirit uh, speak into our own hearts that we would take seriously the warning that we not fall away from the truth. And so, Lord, thank you for your word and for these moments together in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul also told Timothy, until I come, to devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. That's what we're going to do today. The public reading of Scripture. And as uh, we do that in your bulletin, there is a handout that will be very important today if you want to stay awake. If you don't, that's okay, too. I understand. There is a great, uh, a great scene in C.S. Lewis's writing where it's pictured in heaven. You have all these animals that are, that are there. They all have personalities and, and so on and so forth. And they're, they're there in the presence of Aslan, the, the Christ. And I think, I can't remember if it's this old badger. I can't remember what type of animal it was. But the poor old badger nods off to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know what, that's all right. Probably needed a good nap. <laughs> so if you fall asleep, don't worry about it. I, you come to me and you apologize. You don't need to do that. I fall asleep, but I just keep talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> On your handout, let's, uh, let's begin. We're going to look at chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It's the opening greeting. And in verse 1, there's the challenge to dedicate ourselves to lifelong service to the Lord. There is God's precious gift of saving faith. Listen, there is the deity of Jesus Christ. For all of you 30% evangelical Christians who do not believe that Jesus is God, just read 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. That's all you have to read. And then in verse 2, we see the blessings of intimate, personal fellowship with the Lord. Let's read it together. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours 
by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Does it get any clearer than that? Jesus Christ is our God and Savior. Verse 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. We have encountered already this word knowledge, and it's going to recur some 16 times throughout these three chapters. And Peter is not talking about intellectual knowledge about Jesus Christ. He's talking about a personal, intimate fellowship. And it is through that intimate fellowship as we meditate and reflect on the Word of God that Paul tells us the Holy Spirit will transform us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Do you have personal, intimate relationship and fellowship with Jesus Christ on a regular basis? If you don't, you're going to be swept away by the false teachings penetrating the church. Amen. Let's take the offering and go home. <laughs> All right. Intimate relationship with the Lord will lead us to joyful service for the Lord. Verses 3 through 11, how to live a godly life. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you be, may become partakers of the divine nature. What are those precious promises? Subtle hint. Subtle hint. Here, here are the keys to an effective Christian life. Personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ and dwelling on, being rooted in, standing firm upon the precious promises of God, the Word of God. That's, that's it. That's the key. Verse 4, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and faith and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Talking about the characteristics of the Christian life. No grow and show. We need to grow in Christ-like character and conduct. Verse 8, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfaithful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, if you are coasting in your Christian life, you are going downhill. You are either intentionally seeking to grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ and his word, intentionally seeking to cultivate the character qualities and the conduct of Jesus Christ, or you're going downhill. Are you growing or coasting? It's as simple as that. Genuine knowing, verses 2 and 3, will lead to diligent growing, verses 4 through 11. Which is it? It's your choice. <laughs> he has given to you everything you need for godliness, for living the Christian life. Everything. How many times have I said, well, Lord, I just don't, I just need, I just, you know, a little bit. No. I have given to you everything you need for life and godliness. Well, okay, verse 12. Verses 12 to 15, Peter speaks of his approaching death and there is the importance of remembering our priorities. 
What are the priorities of the Christian life? No growing shell. Thank you very much. I'll pay you upwards. <laughs> oh, your, your payment is out of this world. <laughs> what are the priorities of the Christian life? To know and love the Lord, to grow and become like the Lord, to go and show the Lord to others. Know, grow, and show. And so Peter says, I want to remind you of these things. Look with me. Therefore, verse 12, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it is right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. When I am gone, you need to remember no grow and show. <laughs> and three times in this passage, Peter says, I want to remind you of these things so that when I am gone, you will remember. I was talking with Mary Anderson this morning at the beginning of, of uh, our first service. And uh, she said, Pastor, how long have you been here? And I said, well, I'm glad you reminded me that. I forgot. As of the first Sunday of this month, we have completed 18 years. <laughs> and I don't know, you know, how long I will be here. But if, if Jesus tarries and I'm gone, I want you to remember the essentials of the Christian life. <laughs> so I just keep, I'm, and I just really appreciate Peter because he says, I'm just going to keep reminding you of these things. <laughs> right? Until I depart. Well, in verses uh, 16 to 21, we see Christ's glory and the trustworthy prophetic word. We see the supremacy of God's word even over amazing personal experiences. I, I have, uh, over the years that I have been with you, I've seen these various fads that have come through the church and Oh, boy, and we get all excited because somebody went to heaven and came back and told us all about heaven. And wow! And we get all cranked up, you know. Amazing personal experiences. Well, guess what? Peter had an amazing personal experience. And let's read about it. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Who's the we? Peter, James, and John. For when he received Jesus, received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice <clears throat> was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves, Peter, James, and John, heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. He had this amazing personal experience. Now here's the question in advance. Did Peter put stock in his amazing personal experience, or did he put stock in the written word of God? Which one did he value the most? Huh? So let's find out. Verse 19. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter says, if I have to choose between my amazing personal experience, and he doesn't in any way, you know, uh, set that aside, but he says, you would do well to pay attention to the prophetic word, which is even more confirmed than my great personal experience. So yeah, people have all kinds of experiences, and, and churches just 
run rampant with, well, this you know, vision and that word and this and that and everything else, and people get so cranked up over what's the latest prophetic word. And as a pastor, I'll just tell you, I'd like to see people get that cranked up over the written word of God. All right, sorry. No, I'm not sorry. <laughs> this is the very thing we're talking about. We come into chapter 2, and chapter 2 focuses in <clears throat> on these false teachers and their false doctrines. In verses 1 to 3, we see the danger, the danger of false teachers. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, wolves in sheep's clothing who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not Asleep. I shared with you uh, a week or two ago, I can't remember now, but every time I think about this, these uh, surveys and what it reveals concerning evangelical Christians, I shared with you how every, every time I hear that word evangelical Christian and thinking about all of the, the false doctrine now that is just being swallowed, the hook line is, it just angers me, it makes me angry. And I shared with you Part of why I thought I was angry is because that word evangelical is built on the Greek word euangelion. And euangelion means good news. To be an evangelical Christian is, is to believe in the good news of Jesus Christ, right? And so, how can you believe in Jesus Christ if you do not believe that he's God and you believe that he could sin? And you do not believe that this is necessarily the word of God. How can you call yourself a euangelion Christian? Good news Christian. What good news is there in that? Well, I'm even madder today. <laughs> and I, I can't begin to recreate for you. But there is this thing today that is absolutely penetrating the church called progressive Christianity. Progressive Christianity. Christianity, and I'm, the reason I'm angry is because I'm beginning to find out and understand what progressive Christianity is. And it's just like everything else that we see in the world. They have committees that sit there and they, they come up with beautiful ways to express things that are just exactly the opposite of what they really are. And that's what progressive Christianity is. Number one, it's not Christianity. Number two, it's not progressive. It is what Peter calls destructive heresy. And it has penetrated the church. And, and the, the survey results that I have been sharing with you are a result of progressive Christianity that has taken over the Bible colleges and seminaries of America and they've cranked out their little, uh, whatever, drones. <laughs> who have gone out into the churches and have propagated absolute heresy. And it is leading people to hell. And I thought, well, pa you know, Pastor Ray, I talk to myself. <laughs> Pastor Ray, you just need to calm down. <laughs> and I think about the Lord Jesus Christ, how he went into the temple and he fashions a whip and he drives out the money changers. And he talks to the professional holy guys, the Pharisees, and he calls them snakes in the grass and whitewashed tombs. And I'm sure he was just very loving and gentle about it all. And I think maybe we ought to get a little bit excited that wolves in sheep's clothing, just like the Bible says, have come into the church and are absolutely destroying people. And by the way, you won't believe it, but there's a handout on progressive, <laughs> progressive Christianity over here on the, on the uh, 
Spiritual Growth Resource Center. In, in general, members of this movement do not ascribe to the biblical doctrine of the inerrancy of Scripture. They don't believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. And again, in general, they do not believe that the Bible is the literal word of God. <clears throat> Progressive Christianity also tends to emphasize what is known as collective salvation over the biblical concept of personal salvation. So you don't personally get saved, your, your culture gets saved. And how does the culture get saved? By buying into the tenets of socialism and communism and Marxism. And so you, you think, Pastor Ray, you're out of your gourd when you talk about the dangers of communism. It's in the church. It's what's happening to the church. It's what's happening to our culture. That's not a political statement. That's a spiritual statement. We are being overtaken by the doctrines of demons. And the only remedy is the Word of God. And if we do not get into the Word of God, we too are going to be led astray by destructive heresies. So what is going to happen to these false teachers, beginning at verse 4? The Lord will deliver false teachers to destruction, and he will rescue the godly from their trials. Now we're going we're to read through these next verses of Scripture, and I just want you to picture in your mind these guys in their three-piece suits, and their fancy cars, and their big houses, and their planes, and they just go around, you know, delivering the word of God to the people. And they're so handsome, and, and the ladies are so beautiful. They dress in the most modern garments, and they stand up there as, as preachers of the word of God. And they're proclaiming heresy, and I want you to see how Jesus sees them. We look on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. And I want you to see how the Lord describes them. Verse 4, chapter 2. <clears throat> For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. By the way, let me just stop right there. But I, I really appreciate this passage of Scripture. We'll, when we get there, we'll talk about righteous Lot and so forth. But righteous men and women are tormented by what they see happening in our culture. You know, well, you know, God's in control. Yes, God is absolutely in control. And God is working out his will and purpose, and he absolutely is. And I believe that, I think, probably more than any of you. But godly men and women are tormented by what they see happening within a culture that is absolutely being destroyed. And, and so, yeah, take your blood pressure medicine, and I do. <laughs> Keep it under control, and I do. But I have been mentioning to you, I have a study on Psalm 119 and, uh, that's available on this center. And a, a contemplation and celebration of the Word of God and the God of the Word. And uh, as you go through Psalm 119, you see very clearly what the psalmist's attitude is toward the ungodly and toward the wicked. And you will probably be amazed and maybe even a little bit shocked. And I think it is a model for us of what our attitudes should be toward the wicked. You know, and maybe we should reflect God's attitude toward the wicked. You might want to take a look at Psalm 119. 
And so uh, Peter continues on with his description. Righteous Lot was tormented in his soul by what he saw in his culture. Verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. They are already under punishment. John 3.36 says the wrath of God already abides on those who reject Jesus Christ. Verse 10, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, you know, now picture that guy in a, in a gorgeous three-piece suit, and that lady with her hair just exactly right, and her, her uh, suit of uh, clothes that she wears once, and, and then, I mean, she's got a wardrobe that you can't believe. But Jesus looks on the heart, verse 12. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters in which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They identify with the church. They identify with Christians. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children, forsaking the right way, they've gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam and the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness, you see. So we see the, the, the depravity of these teachers. Outwardly, wow. Inwardly, God despises what they are doing. When you look beneath the surface of popularity, Attractive, influential false teachers, they are truly repulsive and ugly in their motives, in their methods, and in their materialism. By their fruits, Jesus said, you will know them. Well, verses 17 to 22, we have the deceptions of false teachers, and we see the fate of those who are led astray by their, their deceptions. Listen. You choose what you will believe. You have the power to choose what you're going to believe. What you do not have the power to do is change the consequences. If you follow the ways and the teachings of false teachers, that is your choice. But you are going to suffer the consequences of that choice. Verse 17, these are waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilement of the world through the knowledge of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to never have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Well, genuine faith resists the temptations of this fallen world that appeal to our sinful nature. It manifests itself in perseverance in the truth to the end. And we must persevere. Jesus said the one who remains faithful to the end will be saved. Genuine faith manifests itself 
in perseverance. All right, let me hasten along. We're in chapter 3. We're going to move through chapter 3 fairly quickly. <clears throat> chapter 3 says, remember what I told you. <laughs> My wife says penetration, <laughs> repetition penetrates the thickest of skulls. After all this time, I still can't get it right. Chapter 3, verse 1. This is now the second letter that I have written, that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing following their own sinful desires. Listen, false teachers are coming. False teachers are here. And we need to be founded in the truth of the holy prophets, the Old Testament, and the holy apostles, the New Testament. That is the foundation of what we believe and what we practice. Remember their words. Verse 3, scoffers in the last days, knowing that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is this promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. <clears throat> but by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. You see, scoffers in the last day. We have them today. We have them today. Oh, it's, you know, it's been going like this. You talk about Pastor Ray, Jesus is coming, second coming of Jesus Christ. Where is this coming? I don't see it. Things are just kind of going on like they've always gone on. Well, <clears throat> Peter says, the day is coming, verse <clears throat> verse 10, they start verse 8, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord, listen, is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient with you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach Repentance. I have to remind myself, I want Jesus to come. I'm excited about the Lord's coming. I'm looking forward to heaven. Anybody in favor of that? <laughs> right? But Jesus is not going to come back on my time frame. He's going to come back on his. And he is patient, not willing that any should perish. And if Jesus came back today for the church, how many people would perish because the church was gone? He wants us to continue sharing Jesus with others. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Every time I look at my house, I say, come Lord Jesus, because <laughs> I know it's going to burn. <laughs> Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Well, as we come to the end of this book, verse 14, Peter says, be diligent until Jesus comes. Be diligent until he comes. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. When Jesus comes, he wants to find us pursuing holiness in our lives. Verse 15, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. And that means two things. It means salvation for those who don't yet know him and sanctification for those of us who do. 
We are to be growing in holiness and Christ-likeness when he comes. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom, wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks of them of these matters. And I love this. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. <laughs> you read through the Apostle Paul and you kind of scratch your head, you're in good company. Peter read through the writings of the Apostle Paul and said there are some things that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. That's what progressive Christianity is all about. Twisting and distorting the scriptures to make them mean what they do not mean, and they're doing it to their own destruction. Verse 17, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and and to the day of eternity. Amen. <laughs> How about that, Casey? Twice <laughs> in one day. <laughs> now listen, are you growing in your Christian life? If you're not growing, then you're coasting, and you're coasting downhill. Are you growing in your knowledge of the Word of God? Are you growing in your personal relationship, intimate fellowship with Jesus Christ? It is fellowship with Jesus, and knowledge of the Word of God that will prevent us from being led astray by destructive doctrines. Grow in the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this very precious and very timely book. I am shocked at how quickly the church is being led astray from the truth of the Word of God. And Lord, we are, <coughs> we are mindful that in the last days, that is exactly what your Word says will happen. And we are indeed in the last days of the church age. And you yourself said, Lord Jesus, when I come, will I find faith on the earth? Lord, we want to be found among those who have persevered in the faith. We want to be found to be faithful until the very end. Whatever that end is, we want to be faithful to you and to your word until the end. And so I pray, Father, that we will hear the warning of Peter, the warning that you are giving us today, that we will indeed be rooted and grounded and established in the truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.